Okay, so um, I've given a handful of CSS talks, mostly to beginners, and um, and I have a favorite topic to start off CSS discussions because everyone who has ever worked with CSS can relate, and that is why people hate CSS. Um, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of people who just who just they don't like CSS, and especially I found developers don't like CSS because. If you're used to writing in JavaScript or you know PHP or Python or all stuff, and then you start trying to write some CSS, it's a completely, completely different paradigm, and just it makes absolutely no sense. Um, you have problems. You know this is getting better and better over the years, but you have problems where you know why can't the browser just get along and render everything the same? Um, people who are getting, <laughs> I, I like that. The glue is is very apt. That's pretty much it. Yeah, I'm not sure where Safari would fit into this. Um, I don't know. Uh, and then a lot of times people start getting into CSS. The first thing, like if you were to WordPress, first thing you see is something like this, which a lot of times people are like, don't understand what's going on. Um, a lot of times it's user error, uh, you know, where you, you think you're doing it right and you get weird results. And so a lot of people go ahead and they just give up. And they said, oh, I'm not going to worry about CSS. I'm just going to hack it till it works and pray it never breaks, and I'll probably like a week later something changes and it breaks, and they hack it till it works, and whatever. So, the moral of the story though, is don't give up. Um, you can get past it. Uh, you can, you know, and the solution to really getting to be able to use CSS, is to have a better understanding of CSS. Most people who approach CSS don't approach saying, I want to learn CSS. I want to understand how CSS works. What it is is saying, I have a website, I need to make this box go here, and they Google, get some like W3 Schools tutorial, and next thing you know, you know, they can't figure out why it was working. Like they never had to, took the time to sit down and really understand what CSS does. And so this talk is going to go through and clear up some of the misconceptions and some of the basic you know, principles behind CSS. And once you understand those, then when you go to do, you know, more advanced things like CSS3 pro uh, transitions and, you know, user preprocessor and stuff, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, this is really helping you understand CSS. So when you get a bug in CSS, you can understand why you're getting it and not so much like WTF, I hate my life. So, okay, first topic are selectors. Okay, you have basically, um, Four types of selectors. It's on my phone. Excuse me. You have an element selector, a class selector, ID, pseudo class, and pseudo element. These are the three you'll use the most. Pseudo, L, the pseudo class. Um, you'll see. It, you'll use a lot with like your um, your anchor tags um, to denote if it's visited or active, um, and then or hover. Um, and then, coming in CSS3, we're starting to get some more of the pseudo element where you're able to select elements before, um, like, uh, you can pseudo point to a different element from uh, an element like, you know, so this H1, whatever's before it or after it. Um, but, you know, so this basically, what it, the, the, all CSS basically boils down to is you have, you, you give a selector saying select this type of element and apply these styles to it. You know, pretty straightforward. And so, we're gonna quickly, Practice. Last time I gave this talk was at a WordCamp, and so if you're an attendee, I want your mouth properly you know, to be smiling. If you're a blogger, so if you have a blog, you can raise your right hand. If you're a developer, you can raise your left hand. You guys want to practice with me? <laughs> or if you're a speaker, you can laugh. Manac uh, you can laugh as I control you. But you know, this is just really simple, basic I stuff. I actually have never had anyone say that, so I've never had to laugh on demand. <laughs> I don't know if I could laugh like on demand, like maniacally, like ha ha ha. That sounded really bad. I will practice. I'll practice. Okay, so let's say we have an element in our C in our document that matches all four of these rules. How many here? Just think in your mind for a second. Which rule would apply to this? So say I have, I have, a, I have an anchor tag. All these rules apply to it. Um, what color would that anchor tag be? Green. Any any other thoughts? Red. Black. It'll be red. Okay. 
The reason why it's going to be red is something called CSS specificity. It took me like a solid day of saying nothing else but CSS specificity to be able to say it on demand. But CSS specificity is basically, it has this definition, selector specificity is a process used to determine which rules take precedence in CSS when several rules could be applied to the same element in markup. So, there's a hierarchy. The, give it the highest priority are inline styles, which you try to avoid because then it's very hard to change. Um, but everyone's, I mean, there's some certain cases where you use them. Or when you use jQuery, you know, it'll man manually manipulate on those styles. Man, that's going to really bother me, that screen shaking. Um, you have ID selectors, like, you know, header, footer, body, content, or not, well, pound, you have like a pound body. Um, and then class selectors, and then element selectors. So these have the highest priority, then ID, then class, then element. And so there's a way to calculate it. This isn't my idea, but I saw it on the internet and it works really well. Is every element starts with the value of zero. And then for every element value, you add a one. Every class element, you add a 10. And every ID select, and every ID you add a hundred. And so when you calculate, you add up the specificity of a single rule. You can say one is greater than zero, two is greater than one. And the reason why I have these commas is that even if you had 15 elements um, declarations in your, in your rule, if a rule had one class, it would override it. Um, so, it's, it, so it follows the priority of the highest number, then you, and then if it's tied, then you match the next number. So you know this one zero is greater than 15. And this 200 is greater than a 1, 99, and a 99. Does that make sense? So this is an awesome little picture. So one stormtrooper beats two stormtroopers, unless you have a Darth Vader. But Darth Vader with one stormtrooper beats a Darth Vader. And then, but two stormtroopers with Darth Vader beats one. You have two Darth Vaders, but you know, you keep going on. But a Sith Lord will always beat, no matter how many star, stormtroopers and Darth Vaders you have, unless he has an element or a stormtrooper or Darth Vader with him, and then one Sith Lord and two stormtroopers. Uh, okay. <laughs> Props to you guys, because no one's ever called me on that. So I, I know the type, type of crowd I'm speaking to. But, you know, and, and this is really important because, because if you don't understand this, when you look at your rules and you say, I don't know why your, this rule is taking precedence over the other rule, typically what the developer does starts throwing extra just selectors in there hoping he gets, increases the specificity and that can make your style sheets a lot more complicated than they need to be. Whereas if you're able to look and understand specificity then you say, oh, all I need to do is just add one more element or an ID. It would be analogous to the order of operations in that. Yep. Basically. Yep. Exactly. So, if there's equal specificity so these have both two elements, so the value of two, it will use the last rule declared. So color blue. If there's an unequal specificity, I'll use the more specific rule. So this has a value of 101, it's 100 for an ID and one for an element, and this has a specificity of two. And so I'll use that one. Now the good thing is you don't have to calculate this yourself. There are tools to help you. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Firefox, with Firebug, and the developer tools for Chrome. Um, you know, but what, what helps is when you, when you render your page and you look and you say, I expect that to be blue and it's red, you're able, to, you're able to select the item, look at the rules that are being calculated, and say, oh, there's another rule out there that has a higher specificity, and I need to make sure if I want it to be blue, I can add whatever um, additional selectors to have a higher specificity. Or you could say that one has, is way, you know, this, this generic rule has a way too high of a specificity, I can lower this generic rule's specificity down. So, you know, everyone's probably seen this, um, an inspector. And so, are there any questions about specificity? Or is that pretty straightforward? Okay. All right. The second topic is the box model. Um, and with, new, with, with, with modern, more, more, more and more modern browsers, it's not this big of an issue. But especially when you're back in this IE6 days, it was a huge issue. 
but you have two basic display types, inline and block. There are other ones, especially CSS3 gets into more other display types, but traditionally, inline and block is kind of the two defaults that you have, um, and they behave you know, very differently. If I, if I had a document and my only CSS role was asterisk, which this is a special character that has a specificity of zero, um, so if no rules apply, this one will, and uh, it just takes all the all the div elements and and you know lines them up like you have like an inline sentence, and then a block, it'll take whatever element that is, give it a block div or like a block element, and it'll take up as much width as it can to to its right, as little vertical space as it can, and it will stack those elements on top of each other. Like I said, there's other ones that you can use that you can, an inline block, if I remember correctly, is basically it'll treat it like it's inline, but allow you to have padding, padding and margin and border, um, which that can be convenient for, for some things. Uh, so the box model itself is pretty straightforward. You have your width, your padding, your border, and your margin. Um, and so, Every time a block element in your document will have these different layers. And so if we have, as a demo, here's our HTML, class hello world, it's a div. We tell that class, hey, you're gonna have a color of red. Simple enough. I got a quick question for you. Yeah. When would you use a class and when would you use an ID? Okay. So IDs, according to this uh, HTML specifications, IDs should be, well, okay, if you're in, if you're in HTML, the ID should be something that's unique. So you should only use an ID once. So like you shouldn't have like two IDs of footers in your document. You should only have one ID or a class. One large container, that's an ID. You can use ID, yes. A lot, very, it's very common in, you know, to have like an ID of content. Like I have my header, my footer, my content. Um, you know, and so uh, typically the things I'll have is I'll have like a header, you know, like, like my, my, biggest prior, my biggest items. I'm going to use an ID. Then I use classes for everything else because you can use a class multiple times in a document. You technically can use an ID multiple times in a document, but it'll, typically when you're using JavaScript and other things, it'll break stuff. So it's, it's not recommended. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the font size to 28 just so I get a little bit bigger. And then so we can see what space this um, element is taking up, I've given it a background, uh, yeah, I gave it a background color of red. And so let's say I love like boxes. Like I don't know what it is. I don't like rectangles. I like boxes, squares. And so I say I want to have a width of 200 and a height of 200. I say that's the perfect size. I don't want any bigger, any smaller. Um, I like it just the way that is. Well, my boss comes to me and says, "You know what? That hello world's tucked up in that corner a little bit too much. I need to uh, um, change that." So I add a padding, you know, of like you know 20 pixels. And so when I do that, you'll notice my box gets bigger. So if I go back, that's smaller, go back and get bigger. And so one of the traditionally most misunderstood concepts, um, issues is width, height, and padding um, that trip people up. So if you take a look at this, the traditional box model will have the width, and then it will apply the padding, and then the border, and then the margin. And so if I come back to here, um, it will go ahead and say, you know, apply the width of 200 pixels and 200 pixels, and then apply an additional 20 pixels on each side, which turns my box into like 240 by 240. Same thing with border. Um, and then, yeah, I have a slide I added for the, uh, um, in fact, I should put that sooner. I'll, go, I'll skip to it real quick. Okay, so I can tell this a couple people like, yeah, sit, moving in their seats. If you only need to support IE8 or above in a, any modern browsers, you can use box sizing, which you can declare something like this, and you can say, hey, for WebKit, Mozilla, and then other browsers, use border box, a box sizing of border box. And what that will do is it'll calculate the width, including padding and margin. If you're like with us, we have to support IE7, we can't do that. I wish we didn't have to support IE7, um, but until we can get official word that we can get rid of it, um, I have to use the old method. But this is, you know, if you can use box sizing, it makes your life so much easier. So, 
Um, I learned that here at this conference today, uh, yesterday, from Josh's talk. So, all right. So, once again, um, where was I at? Yeah, and so if I wanted this box to only be 200 pixels, if I have to use the old method of doing things, I would have to actually subtract 200, you know, 20 pixels from uh, my width and my height. I actually I'd have to subtract 40 pixels from my width and height because it would get applied on each side. Then, same type of problem, 100% width. Um, if I declare 100% uh, width, I'll look at my box and say, what the heck? It's gone more than 100%, it's gone off the screen. Same type of issue is with these 100% widths is that it will take up all the space and then on padding and then on add-on border. And so um, in old CSS, if you wanted to not have it, if you wanted to default just take up 100% width, you just have to not de declare a, uh, a width and it will fill in the, uh, the space. Back then, I don't know why they implemented it this way, where like it'll fill in the space and take and take into account border and pixel and stuff. But then, if you give it a width of 100%, it's like just kidding. But that was a typo in CSS back that they implemented stuck until. Was it really a typo? Yeah, it was a typo. Uh, the width, the way widths performed. The width is calculated was a typo in CSS back. If you look back to Netscape and early version of IE, it doesn't calculate it that way because it doesn't make sense. And then Firefox came out and implemented it that way because of the typo. They wanted to hold true to the spec, and there you are. That's awesome. That's why you have specs. I'm just kidding. That's why you <laughs> proofread your specs. Or at least if you're implementing them, say, hey, guys, this spec is weird, and let them change it. Yes. No, you're fine. Um, okay, here you say background. How come you don't use background color or border? You know, is it better to use the, I don't know if you call this where you put them all in one, but yeah. border left, border right. Yeah. So um, typically, so I just, for shorthand and for like space reasons, I use background, but yeah, background versus background color is totally acceptable. I might, correct me if I'm wrong, you know the nice thing about this is if you, if I was specifically, um, so if I had another element that added some additional, another rule that added some additional um, background changes. If I did just background, I think it would set that for all the properties. But if I did background color, it would. I'd, I'd be sure it would just be manipulating that one property. I can't. Can't remember if that's true or not. Um, but this is. Kind of, I typically t t treat it as just a shorthand. But if I know if I just want to manipulate the background color, I'll specify it out. Um, same thing with border. Uh, same, thing, same thing with padding. You know, you can either use the padding. You can use a shorthand of listing it out. Top, left, bottom, right, or top, right, bottom, left. I went to bed at like two o'clock last night. So, um, and then, but you can still say it's padding dash left, padding dash bottom. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, so here's another thing that trips people up when you're first getting to you know CSS. So what I went ahead and did is, is technically my document body by default will have some, some margin on it or some padding or both. And so I just have this selector saying, hey, by default I want all my box, all my box elements to not have any padding or margin. So that's why this guy collapsed out. And then I gave it, you really cannot see the color differences on. I highlight like which ones I'm changing. And they don't show up. It's like the same color on here. Anyway, um, and so I gave it a border of a different color, so you can see here's where the body content is, that's where the border, and then here's the document body. And so, let's say I want to add some margin. I say, hey, you know, I want to have 20 pixels on the top and the bottom, and I want to have 10 pixels on the left and the right. Um, and to get some nice margin, that looks really good. And my boss comes to me and says, hey, I want two of these boxes. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll change the height to 100 to shrink my box down, and I'll add another div. And I say, hold on a second. So I have like 20 pixels up at the very top, 20 pixels at the very bottom, but I only have 20 pixels right here. Like typically when someone's trying to see assist, they might expect to have 40. So another thing that, that trips people, people up is margin collapse. And so if you were to inspect this element, you hover over it. Here's the margin for 
my top div, and then here's the element, the inspection for my bottom div, and you can see they're sharing the same margin space. And ultimately, this is actually a really good thing. It would it'd be very hard to make nice looking like article text, like I work for a newspaper, so it'd be really hard to make a nice flowing looking document if I didn't have this margin collapse. The problem comes is when you start using margin and, and you don't realize where padding or, pad, or margin could be collapsing. And so you might say, hey, I want to have this mast head, you know, and have a margin of 10 pixels around it, and then uh, around here, and then I want, want to have my title to have an additional 20 on top and bottom and 10, and then I want to have some, even some additional one, you know, whatever. And, and so I think in my head, this is how this is going to render, and instead, it renders like this because all of this margin is, is touching each other and say, hey, I can collapse. I'm going to try and collapse. Another trick problem, and once again, this isn't as big of an issue with more modern browsers, but like especially IE 6, 7, and 8, calculating the margins if you have really complex layouts can get tricky, and some browsers can say, hey, I think these two margins are touching, I'm going to collapse. And other browsers say, I don't think they are touching, I'm not going to collapse them. And so my rule of thumb is only use margin when you want them to collapse. If you need to do any other type of layout and stuff, you can, there's other properties you can use. Like you use padding and different things, but you only use margins when you want them to collapse. Um, that'll help keep your documents pretty, a lot more simple. Okay. Any questions on the box model? All right, if there's anything you can take away from this talk, which I've just stole from Josh's talk, is the box sizing. Um, if you only have to support IE8 and above, it makes your life a whole lot easier. Okay. That's gotta be the biggest understatement I've heard this entire conference. I think everyone said that in his talk too. <laughs> okay. Third topic that people seem to get a little hard. So if the first topic of selectors is pretty straightforward, you just need to learn about it. Second one, you know, there's a little bit of trickiness to the box model. Third one, floating elements. Can get even just a little bit more tricky. And um, apparently it didn't save when I added my, my, uh, my uh, different colors for the, for the elements. So we can all just read non-styled HTML and CSS. Okay, so what I, what I have here is I have this container. And then I have in here, you know, div class box one, two, and three. And then over here I say, hey, get rid of any default margin padding. I want the body itself to have a margin of 20 pixels. I want my container to have 20 pixel padding on the inside, have a background. I can't even remember what color this is. I should have used just names instead of that. Um, and then I have on my box, I want to have a default width of 100 and height, width of 100 and height of 100. And then one's going to be red, two's going to be green, three's going to be blue. And so if I render this out, this is what I get. It'll go ahead and give my container a width. It'll fill the space uh, horizontally as much as it can. And then I'll give each one of my boxes 100 pixels um, tall and 100 pixels wide, and I'll stack them on top of each other. And so if I want to change the way these things stack or, fl or move, like this blue box over to the right-hand side, one, op one option until you get in into CSS CSS3 stuff is you have to float it. And so there's a handful of things that happen when you float a property. So when you float, you can either float to the left, the right, inherent, or none. Um, and then whatever element you float, that block element will shift to the left or right of the content as far as it can. And then the parent's element, the parent's <coughs> element's content will flow around that element. And here's the key, this floated element is now removed from the normal flow. So what the normal flow is, is this idea of, of box elements get rendered and they stack on top of each other. That's, that's what's called the normal flow. So if I come over here and I say, hey, box number one, you used to be up here in this, right in this corner. I want you to float to the right by giving it a float right. Then I go to my bottom one, this blue box, and say, hey, blue box, I want you on the right hand side as well. So I'll float it to the right. And then I say, what the heck? I took this blue box, I floated it to the right, and two things. One thing is I might have expected it to go right here, because there's space. 
And the second thing is now my container's like not containing my stuff. And that can be really frustrating. And then I say, well, maybe if I float my green box to the left, and, my, and then have my blue box float to the right, then I'll line up. Which I'll do that, and then, oh my gosh, now my container looks really ridiculous, and I have no idea uh, why it's going on. So, once again, see so the normal flow, where I'll try and, and, and render. So, when it, when, it, when it talks about removing that parent from the normal flow, Floated, for floated items, for a parent, traditionally, it's like kids sneaking out, sneaking out at night. These kids are completely aware of where they're at and where, the, where each other is, but the parents, they have no idea. The parents have no idea their kids are sneaking out at night, going out to have fun. And so this parent is unaware that it has these three kids in there. So traditionally, if you have to support older browsers, one, the one way to clear this up is you add another element, div element, you know, you give it a property of, uh, I give it a class of clear, and, I'll, and I say, hey, I want you to clear both the right and the left side. So this div will have zero pixels high, it won't, it won't render any space, but, it allow, but it's aware of where these guys are at, and so it allows the, uh, um, the parent to be aware of, hey, I can, I can fill this space. Now, I don't have it in my slides, um, but uh, there's another way you can do that now with more modern browsers. I'm trying to remember what it is. You insert a table after. You need a table after. And then assign that. And there's, there's an, is there an overflow one? They can do overflow auto? I can't remember. I don't know. Off the look. Um, I'll tweet about it. If, you, if anyone wants to know what it is, ask me and I'll, and I'll look it up real quick. Um, this is the traditional way that you can you could solve the problem of your container not um, being where it wants. And then let's say you say, you know what, that blue box, I actually don't want it to render to the left of the red box, I want it to be below it, but I still want it to float to the to the right. I could say, hey, uh, blue box, go ahead and float to the right, but clear to the right as well. It says, hey, clear any floating floating items that are to the right, and then float like you would normally float. And so then you have green, blocks, green, green box to the left, red box to the right, and blue box to the right, but um, underneath. We got another new okay. question. Um, That's fine. Float to the left, float to the right. How come there's not float to the center? Because now I use margin, um, you know, yeah. zero than auto, but is there anything better than that? Uh, no. Not really. There's some CSS three stuff thing in Josh's class yesterday. He was talking a little bit about some of the um, positioning stuff you can do with CSS three in the flex box, but um, not using CSS three. This is just I never understood the same reason either. Is you know, uh, but you can. But yeah. So if you need to do something in the middle, then it's the it's the margin auto. And all it, all it basically saying is is like take this element, put it in the middle and then have automatically fill the margin space on the left and the right. Which works, it just doesn't make much sense. It's not, it's not very intuitive. All right, any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, there are some other common misconceptions. Uh, uh, For example, that uh, stormtroopers use lightsabers? Yeah. Well, that's why there's this, that's why they're, con he's scratching his head. He's like, what is this? Why don't we get that in our gear? At least he can explain it as, at his head. I mean, that's the first thing Luke did is, he yeah, he handed, handed the lightsaber. And he looked straight, straight into it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, uh, element positionings, uh, they're actually pretty straightforward, but it's easy to get them mixed up. Um, and then uh, a couple of misconceptions are, like he's meant, vertical and hor horizontal centering. Um, and so I don't go into the, I don't go into them in these slides. I have an article that 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 goes along with this uh, presentation that has links to really really good short descriptions that explain how to accomplish these things in in CSS. And then with the in CSS three, there's even some better um, solutions to accomplish these problems. Okay, there are a couple of fun tools. CSS preprocessors. If 
you want to learn more, stay for the next presentation. He's going to be talking about less. I'll give you a quick little preview. Um, if you're a developer, when you're, I remember when I first started using CSS, I always thought, man, why can't I have a variable? Like it felt so, it went against everything in my, everything in my being to like duplicate like values all over the place. And so what a preprocessor is basically, in a nutshell, is, it'll, is you can write um, some additional uh, special syntax that's CSS friendly, and then a compiler like Less or Sass will go through, read it, and then compile completely valid CSS. So as a developer and a designer, you get to manage and maintain a much easier code base, and then it's, it'll render out as compiled CSS that a browser can read and understand. Another awesome thing are, are mixins. Uh, if you've ever done rounded corners and how, and how, rounded corners and how you have to have a me, the WebKit, the Mozilla, the Microsoft, the the uh, Opera, oh my God, I can't remember what that browser is called, and then the default. I mean, if you had to write this out every single time, like in this example, manually by hand is a pain. Whereas, whereas in less, I can write a mixin, which is kind of like a function, and basically pass it. Say, hey, I want to do rounded corners with 10 pixels, and I'll go ahead and render. And when it compiles the CSS, it'll put all five lines of code there for me. And while as a developer, I only have to put in one. Another thing I love is nested rules. And I'll let, I'll let uh, Jake go over this more in the next class. And then there's SAS. This is what we use at work. It's very similar to less. There's some technical details of the differences. But if you learn one, it's really easy to learn the other. And yeah, OK. Is one better at one thing than the I mean. So, yeah. So, less. The, the, the thing with SAS is, is it has like a couple extra features. The big ones to be able to extend. I think less is getting ready to support that in the next version. Um, and then SAS is a little bit more um, like explicit in, in declaring certain things. Uh, like with, I believe it was like with mixins or. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they're very, very, very similar. It's, it's really it boils down to preference. I, I use less, and from what I've seen, I think SAS is a little bit more powerful. It has a few features, like one that I've heard of is uh, you can actually, as part of the compilation, it can load an image and turn it into a data URL. That you can actually just you specify the image file name, and it will actually compile that into the, the output CSS. Which mm -hmm. less does not do. Although you can, there's there's some other workarounds. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, less it's actually possible to do it in the browser. Yes. And you can even have it so it all, will automatically watch and re, like reload your your stuff using AJAX once like every few seconds or something. So I have a friend who does a lot of less stuff, and he'll just change it and hit save and switch back to his browser, and it's pretty much already updated, yep. like on the fly. So there's. There's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. Mm -hmm. So it really boils down to personal preference, but you know, for the most part, you know, you know, comparing them side by side, it's it's it, they're really really comparable. So it's not it's not like if you know if you're using one or the other, like you're really dis like you're really you know disadvantaged. Um, I know SAS has Compass, um, which is a uh, which is like a bunch of bi like uh, pre-built um, like mixins and things that you can use. I'm not sure if there's a less com is there's a less version. Yeah, less hat. Less hat. Yeah, I don't want to steal Jake's thunder. <laughs> so, um, recommended book. This is a book that changed. I, I used to loathe CSS. Then I read this book, CSS Mastery by Andy Budd. Um, it's still pretty. It's still really relevant uh, with about the basics. It doesn't have any of the CSS three stuff. Um, but if you want to have a good understanding of CSS, this is an excellent book. It's pretty darn thin, and it basically explains each of the different components. Give some examples and then give some common misconceptions and hiccups like bugs you'll commonly run into and how to solve them. If you want to go a little more to the cutting edge of CSS, CSS Tricks is an awesome blog. Um, Chris Coyer runs it. And uh, if you want to kind of stay on the, uh, the cutting edge, some of the CSS3 stuff, and things are really pushing the boundaries of you know, what kind of is a glimpse into what you can do in CSS in the future. A lot of stuff, he'll, he'll be very good at saying, this works in all browsers, or this only works on Chrome, or um, whatever, but it's an awesome website. What's the URL for this again? Uh, is, is it css tricks yeah. yeah. Dot com. Yeah. Yep. Pull it up, mine doesn't look at all like yours. This is an old okay. presentation. Oh, okay, <laughs> it's been updated. Yeah, he's okay. probably new. Less yeah. confused now, thank you. Okay. 
All right, so I do have the companion article that goes along with this. It's just cover.com slash CSS. It has links to all the different resources I use to put this together. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, so if you, and then if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or talk with me. Uh, one. Yeah, go ahead. A I, yep. is, there, is there or is there not that you're aware of uh, an editor of some sort or something that you can validate your CSS through that will come back and give you warnings and say, this is not handled the same in this browser and that browser or, or whatever. Maybe not fix it for you, but at least give you a heads Gets up. a heads up. Ones that are going to be different. It seems like it'd be easy enough to do. You'd think somebody would have it. Is yeah, I know. Like that? Yeah, CSS Lint is really good. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. CSS Lint. L I N T. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because I'm trying to think, because my editor doesn't have that. My editor will look, catch like spelling mistakes. Like if I spell like border, like border. Will hurt your feelings. But yeah, CSS Lint works really well. I got it. What do you think about like the bootstrap and I like the frameworks? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if I use the word frame. As a developer, I don't know if I use the word framework for them, but I guess they are kind of like a framework for CSS. Um, I lo it depends on what you're using. So if I was to go in and implement, like redesign like desertnews.com or ksl.com, I might not use like use all of Bootstrap. I might just use some of their um, the basic things. If I'm writing like an internal tool for like my you know my team to use, I'll definitely use the whole thing of Bootstrap. It gives us a really easy, basic, you know, a, yeah, quick and easy UI. So I know, like at work, we use it a lot for our internal tools to, you know, makes makes them look a little bit prettier than just the default CSS that comes with the browser. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for putting up with a depri sleep deprived uh, presenter.